great to be here today. I will not speak about entrepreneurship and how to build a product and so on. I will try to challenge your mind a little bit to think about how our world will involve, what defines us as humans, what defines our role with machines and technology, how we embrace it. And maybe we will come to the point of the singularity too. So I like to start telling you that this is the best time of human life ever. Yes, and many reasons. First, it took us humans two and a half million years to take off, really. It took us two and a half millions running around being hunter and gatherers, and for 15,000 years we were mainly farmers, and by now no one is a farmer anymore, I, I guess. So I would say the turning point was kind of the steam engine, the uh, beginning of industrialization. So we were, let's see if this works here, yes, at this point when the acceleration really hit it. And since then, life just got crazy. I mean, within generations, life changed so far that it's really hard to explain people how, you know, try to explain someone who from the 50s or 60s what Google is and what Uber is and all these technologies. And then the difference is it took humans 50 years that everyone had a car. And it took us 30 years until every one of you had a computer. It took only 10 years until everyone out there had a smartphone. I think Facebook needed eight years to reach one billion of users. WhatsApp, Instagram, Snapchat, they needed a, only a handful of years to reach a critical mass of 200, 400, 500 users. So each technology coming out there is getting faster, and this is faster, and it's faster. And there's no way that it will stop. And it's really hard for us to imagine how life will be in 10, 20 years if you think that your wealth and your personal freedom and liberty is increasing exponential. Second thing is, it's the best time for you to start a company. If you haven't started a company now, you should. We have the highest amount of liquidity in the market. We have the most, amount, uh, most firms there, programs. It's the, very cheap to start a company, software is cheap, prototyping is cheap. So whenever you want to be an entrepreneur or just want to start something, start it now. Yeah. So, I like to speak a little bit about us, us and sh machines by the way how we often define ourselves. When you meet someone, you often ask, hey, how are you? What do you do? So many of us, most of us, define ourselves by what we do as a job. And for jobs, I think there are two ways to describe them. I say it's, it's manual work, you work physical, or you work with your mind, you're cognitive, yes, you're thinking. And the other thing is you do a work which is pretty repetitive, or you do something which is very individual, like being an artist and so on. And so we have jobs there in the area where you are a farmer, a worker, you're logistics, you're a bank teller, which is repetitive and physical, and then you have cognitive repetitive stuff like chess players. We all know chess players is a lot of math, but it's there's a certain uh, amount of uh, moves you can do, or traders. And then I see at the very top part you have founders because you have to think a lot and it's very individual and everyone who has started a company knows they were not prepared for it and they all know that it became you know, very unique and very different and very challenging. So let's start with the corner of physical and repetitive. At the beginning, um, we had assembly lines, and by now, no one is working in an assembly line anymore, yes? If you go to Toyota, if you go to Volkswagen, it's all done by machines. No one has to sit there and melt and build machines anymore. This is in many areas. The next step is, um, if you look at Amazon, for example, Amazon bought Kiva Systems, so it's Amazon Robotics by now. All, their all the whole logistics is done by robots. They're really small, yeah? They are not smart. They just go back and forth all the time, but they're able to pick an object, drive it there, and you only need the human to check visually if it's the right package. Because the machine doesn't know if it's right or wrong, but even this is solved by Amazon. They have machine learning for visual recognition, and by now the machines are taught to see the difference between a cell phone and a toaster. Yeah. So everything there in logistics, the whole supply chain there is done by machines, which used to be a job for low-skilled people, and which was really manual. And the second is about drones, which are coming. The other thing is agriculture. We used to have 80% of people being in agriculture to be able to provide enough food for everyone. If you go now to the US or to Germany and France, less than 2% of people are still working in agriculture. And the next step is even there that you have whole fleets, but the interesting parts of what the fleets and the machines, the machines replacing humans and horses and so on, is you only need one human 
on top driving and all the other machines, they don't have humans anymore. They don't have drivers anymore. You need one head of the fleet and the rest there is just the machine following the other machines and it's trying to go a certain part. And you have companies like Orbital Insights who use satellite data to control the machines and then you have IoT devices in front of staring everything else there. The other thing is automotive car. So driving, cab drivers, yes, it's a repetitive thing. It's nothing about smartness and a lot of thinking and it's getting you from A to B. And we just had a great talk about mobility, so I don't have to go into it there, but the same is about trucks. Daimler is already prototyping the self-driving trucks, and if self-driving trucks will hit the US, probably seven million people will not have a job anymore. There are one million truck drivers and six more million people working with the truck drivers. Bed and breakfast, uh, car maintenance, unpacking, and so on. So we speak about a huge amount of workforce, yes, physical work, which you don't have to do anymore because we invent machines to do the work for us. Okay, so let's th stay with thinking, yes, we look at traders, and traders used to be a full room, you know, very crowded, a lot of people yelling and doing so. By now, if you look at New York Stock Exchange, for example, no one's there. You see the people cleaning the room, you maybe see the people taking the maintenance, but there are no humans anymore doing something which was really human. And why? Well, by now, 70 to 80% of stock trade is done by machines. They are faster, they're more reliable, they are there 24 hours, they don't vacation, you know, they don't call sick, and they make way, way, way less mistakes. And if we have stock crashes, this is because humans did some mistakes, putting in wrong orders, but at the end, the machines to just execute, and they execute way better than we are. And the same is about chess. Yeah? For decades, people thought chess is a very human thing and no machine can use, solve it. We know it was solved in the 90s. By now, I think a couple of weeks, a month ago, AlphaGo was able to solve this game. They were able to beat the world champion in Go. Most of you, I assume, have never played Go. I tried it a couple of times. It's very complicated. It's a very, very um, complex game. And the interesting part about the machine is the machine was doing moves which you don't find in the textbook. They, the machine was doing moves when it won, which, where the most professional players say, well, this was a very weird, stupid move. But the machine won because it played so often against itself and other players that it had an experience that no one had. And it invented new moves and it made new strategic moves which we as humans did not expect and that's why it was better. So it even became better in the game, not only beating humans, but it brought the whole game to a new level. So what I want to say with this is, no job is safe. And this is nothing to worry about, it's just I want to ask you, if you pick a job, you're a student, you pick a job, think about if a machine could the job better than you do, and then think again if you want to do it. And if you have a job, think if machines could do your job, and what else you would like to do. So whenever you do something physical, we know, yes, machines are doing this. Um, if you, for example, this, this is a, it's a K5, so they use it as a safeguard. It's a robot which is driving around as detecting people, and it's telling you, you know, instead of going for 8 euro 50 out there and being a night shift and checking people if they come in and out, you just use a robot for it. And honestly, most of the jobs you don't want to do. You don't want to be at McDonald's and turning burgers the whole day. I think no one woke up in the morning saying, well, this is my dream job, I always wanted to do this. Yes. Um, but also the same is about journalists. Most of the text written out there is done by machines. Yes, one of our speakers there, he has a company who's using AI to write text. So journalists have some troubles, they have competition. Same about personal assistants. There are a lot of handful startups who, who do, with machine learning, do book your plane, make, like .xa, make your um, time schedule, make your meetings, everything you needed in a personal assistant for this. Today you just need a cell phone and some apps for this. Teachers, yes. When I went to school, there was one teacher for 35 people. Today, with internet and with the, with the online courses, you have one teacher who can educate millions of people. Yes. So technology is leveraging him to reach more, but also meaning you need less people to s achieve the same results. Um, lawyers, yes. There are a handful of startups, Legal Zoom and so on, who do parts of the lawyers. We still need lawyers. But the machines and the software is solving a lot of their basic work, so at the end you need less lawyers to achieve the same productivity for society. And this will be almost for every job. We can have this discussion, I really wish coming forward to me, I can't tell you jobs which will be there in 20 years. I don't know. Founders maybe, but even me as a venture capitalist, I will be replaced. Yes? 
Why? What I do is taking a lot of data and, you know, experience and everything, and there will be machines who will gather and will make better predictive and decisions one day than I could maybe do. And I'm fine with this. Um, same is about data scientists. By now, it's very hard. Everyone needs data scientists. I tell you, in five years, we don't need data scientists anymore because of all the problems when you need people, you will have other smart people trying to solve this with software. So where are we? First, we speak about uh, the Internet of Things, the Internet of Everything, which means robots, machines will be everywhere. Today, most of us have 10 to 15 connected devices in your household. Yes, this number will increase by 100 devices per people. They say by 2030, for every human, there will be a robot, a real robot, you know, walking thing, something like this, or moving out there. So machines will be everywhere, and they will be like insects, yes? You will have them as small intelligence on a very le low level, and on the other hand, you will have AI. Now we come to the topic of AI, because everything, machines and software, is at the end an algorithm controlling it, and AI is eating the world. I just adapted the, you know, by Andreessen, who said that software is eating the world. I say AI is eating the world. For example, the company here, Predictive Analytics, is, um, what they do is they scan um, car signs and cross borders. They do um, big data and a lot of stuff. So they tell you, or they tell police officers, where the next robbery will be before the guy who wants to enter your house already knows it. And they use this in Zurich, they use this in Munich, and crime rate dropped by 40% in these areas because police was already there before the people know that they want to rob this house. And we, you don't need, like, like I think it was not born in the other movie, you don't need weird people and, and water to think about this. You just need software and a lot of data to come out with this. And AI is everywhere. So this is one of my favorite charts. Um, it's from the blog Wait But Why, and if you're interested in this topic, I really highly recommend to read Wait But Why. It's an amazing, cool blog. And we are here. We are here means we are, I would say, at the stage of narrow AI. Today, we have AI which is pretty good in a very specific case. It's better in driving cars, better flying planes, it's better playing chess, it's better trading stocks than any one of us is here. I mean, there are videos of an automated, uh, automated car driving Hockenheim ring or Nuremberg ring with an Audi R8 at a speed of 220 around the corners. I couldn't do this, so they're better at racing cars. So we have narrow AI. The problem with AI today is you can't tell, well, you're good at driving a car now, please fly the plane. This won't work. We are at the phase of it's called supervised and unsupervised learning. Supervised learning means you still have to give the software the data. You have to teach, well, this is a cat. Now go out and find more cats. But the future is you tell them nothing. Yes, you have pre-trained software or you have software which is just able to adapt to the situation. And this will be the next point. So for narrow AI, we will go to the next stage of the AGI, artificial, intel artificial general intelligence. And what most teams are out there currently building are cognitive system. Cognitive systems are, and Google and Facebook and Amazon have already have proven that they implemented them partly, are systems who are able to think. That means they are able to gather their own data and they are able to analyze the data. They make decisions, they measure their own decisions, and then they optimize their own code again. So if you have neural nets, neural nets, for example, and you heard this because Google DeepMind used it, neural nets are kind of black box. You don't really know what's happening inside. It's not anymore that you tell the machine, well, this is the code, and you implement it one, 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 and you have decision trees. No, it's a system which is training itself. It's teaching itself. And we as humans, we already lost control about what the code is doing and what the machine is doing itself. So we have thinking machines out there. We have machines who can do actions, yes? However, we still have to give them a motivation. We have to tell them, please optimize this service, please drive this car safe, and so on. But the next step will be having machine over there. What's coming afterwards is just AI, and somewhere there at the end we have um, artificial superintelligence. And I tell you, we don't understand this. It will be kind of intelligence which will be superior to us, which will be out of our scope. We will not understand it because we humans are pretty arrogant. We are narcissists. We believe we're the only intelligent being. We don't accept other intelligence. So it will be a very interesting discussion when we have another intelligent thing created. So the singularity just mentioned it will be maybe somewhere there. It will be the moment when we lose control of our invention, maybe when software starts to write their own code, when software creates awareness, yes? It will be this moment. I'd say, well, is it wrong that computer performance is better than we? Because in many parts, computers are already way better than we are. We just think different. Um, 
So what I say is, where did, does it lead us? What are the opportunities we as human have? And I say it will be human machines. I only see two ways. Well, if you go progress, if you go with the technology. The first one is becoming a cyborg. Yes, every one of you having a cell phone, having a Fitbit, having a drawbone is already this way. You already integrated software and hardware into your daily life, and most of you wouldn't even wake up in the morning because the alarm is not ringing. So we will integrate hardware more and more. The next step will be kind of glasses, augmented reality. I'm really looking for uh, neural implants, yes, contact lenses. So this will be the next step, upgrading your body, tuning your body. And the other thing is, I call it the uploading. It starts with virtual reality, so first people, you know, will just hang out in virtual reality and enjoy it because it can be way better, uh, way better experience than being out in the dull gray area uh, of life sometimes. And in the end, maybe it will be uploaded. A lot of people, or some, would say, well, why not trying to be purely digital? I don't say that you will do this or not. When I hire people, I always ask them as the last question, would you upload yourself or not? under the case that you have Wolf 4 awareness and that you don't need your body anymore, of course, because you would die, you have cancer or something else. So this is my last slide for this, and why do we do this? Why do humans go for this? And these are the three mantras that they call of um, transhumanism. Yes, the first one is everyone would like if you would be more intelligent. I mean, please raise your hand if you would like to be less intelligent. See? Uh, one. Okay. Good. Yeah? So most of us would be like uh, intelligent. Second is super longevity. I mean, who of you wants to die? Who of you wants to die? And if you give another one, two, three years of living, why not taking it? Why not going for more? I always say, well, I would like to be 120. Why not being 200, 300 years? If you're healthy, if you're mental fit, if your family is still living, why being limited by 70, 80 years? Why being limited by death? Why accepting death? Why not fighting for it? Why not going out there and trying to overcome it? And the thing is, super happiness. This is a thing of our, of, of, of our generation. You only live once and so on. We, I believe we humans are there to live life, to enjoy life. We're not there to work. Yes, this is the annoying part of paying rent and so on. We are there to find our purpose, to be really happy, and to enjoy life as long as we can. And for this, I, I thank you. I, I added a reading list for the people interested in this topic. Yes, if you would like to go further into this. And yes, thank you. That was fantastic. I really enjoyed that. So before we, uh, before we conclude this, since you're also investing in this area, what's the single most exciting company that you see, no matter if you invested or didn't manage to invest, what is the most exciting company in the age of singularity and artificial intelligence? Well, the last exciting company I've found was Microsoft Industries, which are building cognitive systems with the motivation. So they use it for games, for example, Minecraft. You just tell the software, please survive, and the software is learning how to survive, gathering food, gathering shelter. You don't have to tell them how to do this. And this is what I say, the, the, the software used to be like babies, and now they're like small kin toddlers, and they are becoming in the age of growing up and able to learn on their own and having own will and own thoughts. And seeing teams creating this in code, and they don't even understand it anymore, that's the crazy interesting part. Then I wish you lots of good investments in that area. Thank you so much for coming to us and visit us in Cluj here. <laughs> Thank you, Fabian.